Okay, we're going to try to finish up with Freud today. Um, let's go back to the PowerPoint. If you remember, we said that Freud's theory is one that's based on, here we go, pleasure. We're pleasure-seeking creatures. And we can understand people by understanding their need to seek pleasure in various areas of their bodies. And that where that area of pleasure is changes as they mature. For Freud, the stages are purely maturational. Okay? That, in fact, we're born with this pleasure principle, which is the id. This is the nature of all human beings. Yes, you too. All right? <clears throat> that, says Freud, that eventually, however, because of societal values, because of societal constrictors, we have to have an ego that tells us to delay the pleasure until we're allowed to do it. So, for instance, at the anal stage, which we discussed, you have to, boy, Freud would love that, disgust. <laughs> you have to, sorry, you, sorry, I just amused myself. <laughs> Right, right. <laughs> exactly. The, the anal stage, you have to delay the pleasure of defecation, which is very prominent for children at this stage, until you go into the bathroom. And finally, a superego develops, which is basically internalizing the standards of society, and we'll see where that comes from. Okay, last time we talked about the fact that Freud also talks about two stages, the oral stage, where the pleasure is centered in the mouth, and the anal stage where pleasure is centered in, let's just do this, it was pleasant in its, um, the anal zone and its products, and we talked a lot about that. And we talked about the fact that there are fixations at various stages, and that um, if one does not get enough pleasure if society or people around you and for instance almost by definition there's going to be a frustration with um, uh, toilet training and so there's going to be some fixation at the anal stage and people get various kinds of reactions certain personality characteristics remain based upon how people went through previous stages now not I when I outline this, I outline the extremes, but at some points, but everyone has, most people have some aspects of both of these. Most people have some aspects of oral, oral fixations. They eat, they talk, they write, they smoke, they do something, bite on something during times of stress, okay? And of course, an extreme um, anal compulsion would, uh, extreme, um, the yeah, anal compulsive stage would be someone who's obsessive compulsive. And the extreme of anal expulsive, there are people, I don't know, I forgot the name of it, I admit to you. Um, uh, people who can't, th who, who just strew garbage everywhere. They never throw it out, they live in the garbage, they tunnel through the garbage. There have been a few cases of this. P push it down, right? Pack rats? Pack rats. No, well, a pack rat usually exchanges something, right? It's a, they usually, pack rat usually sees something, drops what's in his mouth, and picks up what it's like, right? But it's, yeah. Well, people, no, people have to collect everything and keep it neatly in boxes. That's more on the anal retentive side for Freud, anal retentive. But people just drew things everywhere. And most of some people, and most people have aspects of both in their personality. Okay, people pointed out that oh, I said to myself, hey, I basically have a more anal, uh, uh, anal uh, uh, expulsive or anal compulsive or anal retentive person. We said, yeah, but what about the way you correct papers? Oh, or what about your, your fetish about grammar? Okay, now, the next stage that Freud talks about, let's go back here, is the uh, phallic stage or sometimes called the Oedipal stage. Um, and this stage, by and large, he himself admitted, and Freudians today admit, it's well done with boys and not so hot with girls. But we'll see what he says about both. Okay? <clears throat> You'll notice, even on my picture, that this stage, take my picture for one second, is from three to six years old. Thank you. That's the time, okay? And Freud says that this is the time where for boys the libido is centered in the penis, for girls also will be centered in the genitals, more or less. Okay? And... 
What he says happens here, whoops, what he says happens here is that they're just going to have to go along with this. It's a lot of fun. I don't know if you believe it or not, but there's some interesting things here. The competition with the father for affection of the mother, okay? What you're going to have now is the child now is suddenly going into a state where, right, there's a mother and a father. Then I remember Freud came from a time where most families were traditional. We call traditional families, okay? And the, the boy is madly in love with his mother, right? And now he sees his father is there, also in love with his mother. Not only that, he has to go away and the mother and the father spend time alone. They sleep together and all kinds of other things. So he gets very angry and upset with his father. But there's nothing he can do about it. First of all, his father is much bigger than he is. Right, much bigger than he is. Secondly, um, some Freudians say his father's genitals are much bigger than his. I don't know, we know that, but probably got a peek here and there, right? There's no competition. Now, this is not, this is, this at this point, right, it's just I want my mommy to be with me and not with that guy, okay? But there's tremendous, thank you, fear and anxiety that the father, somehow the boy figures out that this is centered in, um, the genitals being a male in his, in his penis, right? In his phallic, right? A phallic stage. A phallus is a fancy word for a penis. And so he's afraid his father's going to castrate him. So what can he do? Okay, he's too small. See me get my picture in there? He can't fight with his father. So what does he do? He represses his feelings for his mother, and he identifies with his father. And this, says Freud, is where the superego develops, right? <clears throat> By identifying with his father's and his father's ideals, remember part of the superego e super was ego ideal, okay? So instead of fighting with his father, which is a lost cause, <clears throat> he represses his sexual feelings for his mother, and he's told that's a bad thing to feel. It's horrible, the superego. Most males, if you tell them, well, we want you to have a little fantasy about sleeping with your mother, having sexual relations with your mother, are appalled and disgusted. That's their conscience. That's a superego coming through, right? I would say the overwhelming majority of males, right? <laughs> because it's been suppressed. It's there. It's there, okay? But it's suppressed, and it's suppressed by identifying with the father. Ever see little boys with their plastic razor shaving like their fathers? Of course, some, I don't know if you're aware of it, but if you look at how God created the universe for large males, he gave all the males of all large mammalian species, all large mammals, have hair on their face or on their neck to make them beautiful, right? And only one species is stupid enough to take a knife and scrape it off. But some of us are not. We realize we stay beautiful with the hair. <laughs> anyway, okay, that kind of stuff. I mean, identifying with a father, can, so you can stay on me for a while. Identifying with the father, doing things the father does, wanting to be like a father, or later Freudians would say another male figure, if the father's gone, right? Wanting to do what daddy does, kinds of things. And people can remember, anybody remember, any boys, we don't have too many males here today, things about your father that were a little that were not normative that you wanted to Im imitate. I'll give you an example. My father, he was in an a traffic accident when he was in his early 20s, and he sometimes he limped, okay? And I remember when I was a little kid, I used to go around limping like my daddy, right? So, right, by the end, uh, different operations, he would, you know, he, 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 you know, he had a, a noticeable limp. But when I was a kid, they, it was, he would limp when he was tired. And I remember noticing that once when he was coming home, that he was coming home from work and he was limping a little. So I used to go around limping. All right, anybody else remember anything like that imitating? Most people don't. You, we try to suppress some of this stuff. But, right, so those are the kinds of, 
Those are the kinds of things. It's a strong identification with the Father. Wanting to be like the Father. And let's go back to the PowerPoint. Ultimately, turning sexual feelings away from the mother, even though they're always there, just repressed, and projecting them onto other women. Now, of course, all males will deny 99.9 something percent of males will deny that they want to that they have a, 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 an emotional a sexual attachment with your mother if you will it's really not sexual here it's sexual but it's not genital here but then Freud said it becomes projected or Freudians through the gen once you reach the genital stage it becomes projected the way of course you're denying it you're in of course you say you don't feel that way you're in denial the fact that you find it repugnant and repulsive is a sign you're repressing it with your super ego Right? All right, let's keep going. So, what, go ahead, say it. <laughs> go ahead. She's not a witch if she drowns. Right, exactly. <laughs> okay, exactly. Okay. Now, so what Freud says, this, of course, is the, is the key to proper social development. You assume proper social roles, okay? You assume, you begin to get your conscience because your father tells you what's right or wrong. It's not just the Oedipal complex. You're identifying with your father's values. Okay? You begin to take a proper role in society, project your sexual feelings onto other women. So this uh, then becomes, this then becomes the basis for children um, uh, uh, later developing uh, uh, proper social roles and families, right? And and any um, uh, and, and any desires that you have toward the other women's women are um, are controlled by the super ego. Okay. Now Freudians are nothing if not almost all their metaphors are biological. So for instance, Freud will explain, tells you, and the Freudians tell you that the nature, that the nature of human personality, of male and female personality, mimics the sexual act, right? The heterosexual sexual act, okay? Women are open and receiving and nurturing, and men are dominating and trusting and conquering. That's why women assume the nurturing roles in society. That's why men, right, assume the leadership in war and being the leaders in society. Remember, he came from a very traditional society. But I have to tell you, when this stuff about, oh, should women be in combat roles and people got upset, I told people, don't be upset. It's not going to happen. And it doesn't do much. Very few women want to be in combat roles. There are some, okay, but not too many. Okay, and most of the women who are in the army are not in combat roles as pilots or, and there were some, but not too many. Freud said, well, that's the way it's supposed to be. Okay, biology is personality destiny. And men, of course, really want, because the it is in there, okay, you've turned it away from your mother, now you want to go and possess women. But your super ego, both your ego and your super ego, what if you can get away with it, with raping a woman, say, hey, that's the wrong thing to do. And Freud would tell you, men who are rapists, they have a, a, a poorly developed super ego. They didn't have a, when they talk about not having a strong father figure to show the boy values, that's, that's classic Freud, Freud turned into modern language, okay? Because the father, according to Freud, is the one who gives the ideas and tells you cannot do that. Right? Sex has to be consensual. As a matter of fact, you should be married. Okay, certainly in Freud's time, that was, that's what the story was. Then, then you can, so this desire to reach out and dominate and possess is controlled by the superego. And when the superego breaks down, when the superego is not well developed enough, when there is not, and when the fa you don't have a proper identification with the father, that for Freud explains criminal behaviors and explains a lot of other things that he at that time called deviant behaviors, etc. 
Okay? And the Freud, we don't have time for it. The Freud have, explains for all kinds of things why some people have shoe fetishes and some people have this and some people have that. Right? Explain, explains all those things. Let me tell you right now before I go on here, modern psychology has tried to drive emotions out of psychology. When you go into teaching, you will see it's all information processing. Talk about an emotionless psychology. A machine is the metaphor for for human cognition right and people like Bandura said wait a minute I don't think so I think there has to be self-efficacy Piaget said even though they were he was all about cognition said wait a minute it's obvious to me that failures that and successes bring different emotions to things now Freud is completely emotional but he but he, the fact that we have, we have a school system now that says, it almost, we have had paper, reports in the newspapers for years about how emotionally taxing, about how upsetting, about how emotionally damaging it is for kids to take these standardized tests. Nobody seems to care. Kids throwing up the night before. Okay. So, the question of emotions, of honors, of values, right? And, and once there was a principal who read a, a story about how he remembered he had a kid who, he read a, a, a poem from a teacher who had taught a kid what a noun was, and the kid was in jail now. And he said, gee, I wonder if I should have spent more time on something else. <laughs> you know, it doesn't matter. What so, when we see this, now this stuff is fun, but you have to remember, emotions are extremely important, and certain other things about the nature of child development. I'll just tell you right now, Freud was really the first one, even before Piaget, to tell us children are not little adults. They're fundamentally, qualitatively different. Right? Oh, what the heck, I'll give this lecture twice. I'll give this twice. Piaget told us that too. Erickson told us that. Ch developmental psychologists spent a long time telling people, reminding people, children are not little adults. That's one reason you don't send nine-year-olds down into to mine coal. That used to happen. Right? That's one reason you treat children differently. That's one reason you have a thing called a kindergarten, where kids are just a play. Not anymore, of course. And we have completely forgotten that lesson in our school. That kids grow at different rates. That you can't decide, this is what I'm going to teach the kid without any sense of, wait a minute, this kid is just doesn't understand what you're talking about. He's not emotionally ready to deal with that. We treat kids like they're, they're little adults now. Oh, they're just like us, they just know less. So teach them, teach them, teach them, teach them, rather than saying, wait a minute, it's just not true. They have different things bothering them. They think different ways. Yeah, go ahead. It's like that at my uh, daycare that I work at. Like, we have to teach the kids, like, they have to sign this for, to eat and, you know, and right. we have to do all this stuff. And I'm just like, they're just little kids, you Ex know? Exactly. And uh, exactly, without knowing. One day, I remember we invited, my son was about three years old. Three? One of my sons. Yeah, he was three. And so he went to an aftercare program. There was one guy who was really nice to him. And so we invited him over for dinner one night, right? And he was a nice guy, and I knew him. So he comes over to dinner, and I'm talking to him, and I, and, and I said, he's, ooh, and he goes, and he runs and crawls on his lap. So we're talking, his first name was Alan. I say, hey, Alan, listen. I, my skin goes, he looks at him like this. He says, Alan, I thought your first name was Mr., <laughs> right? He had, when Mr., whatever his name was, he had no idea that Mr. was a title of respect. He didn't understand it. You really think you're teaching a three-year-old things about, after we studied Piaget, things about what's the nature of, what's the nature of, of, of responsibility, things by having a three-year-old sign a document? Doesn't know, the kid doesn't know. What, what, push it down, say it again. We have to teach him like sign language, like more, please. I'm like, she say more, please, right? They don't understand what please means. Just like you don't understand, Mister, right? My grandson now he's not two. He says, "What's what do you have to say?" He says, "Give, give me." What do you have to say? Peas. So he says, "Peas." Peas means I have to say what you tell me to say to get it. But he doesn't understand the notion of being polite, 
How can he? And Freud's really the first one to tell us this. And we've forgotten it now, and we're perpetrating. So we say, oh, we forgot it. Slap a label. LD, ADD, ADHD. Slap a label on. Rather than trying to understand how kids develop. All right, let's go back here. Okay? I have to say one more thing about that. Did I tell you that I had someone come to me with a five and a half year old? I think I told you that. Who was labeled dyslexic. Five and, I mean, it's just, okay, let's keep going. Okay, so here's what Freud says. What happens when you get <clears throat> fixation at the oral, at the Oedipal stage? When you haven't had a good enough identification with your father. See, for him, you identify with your father, you've got a strong conscience, you've got a strong ego ideal, you know what you want to do in life. Your sexual urges are on toward, on toward other women, and from Freud's perspective, also to, to, to marry and have a family, because that was... Uh, okay, so Freud says, look, here's what happens when you don't get... A, uh, when it's not complete. First, you get guilt over competitive urges. When you have not sufficiently suppressed... Right? Remember, you, you start out with this angry with your father, competing with your father. If you don't suppress it enough, whenever you start to compete, particularly with other men, all of a sudden, subconsciously, this urge to compete with your father comes up. You're out to get your father. I mean, Freud says you want to kill your father. You have to remember, there's two reasons you want to kill your father. Number one, you want your mother. And number two, your father is the one who's giving you the ideals and frustrating your id. The id always wants to kill the superego. Right? When you see the angels in the old movie sitting on the shoulder, right? The angel, the, the angel on one shoulder and the devil on the other. The angel is the superego and the devil's the id. The devil always wants to get... And your father becomes, right? That's what said. Freud said God is a mass neurosis. God is the father in the sky telling you what to do. And you hate it. Yes, all of you hate God. That's right. You just feel so, so angry. Any, or wherever else you get your moral values from, you really hate that, that source of your moral values. You hate it. If it comes from some other kind of philosophy, you hate that philosophy. You hate them, right? But you feel so guilty that you won't admit it. Okay, let's go back to the PowerPoint. So there's guilt over competitive urges. Okay? There's guilt that you want to fight with your father. And there's guilt that the guilt comes out that you really want to do something horrible to the person with whom you're competing, rather than competing in a good way. There's apprehension and competition with other men in general. Okay? There are problems with intimacy since they evoke Oedipal feelings. The other kind is the feelings toward the mother. If you have not sufficiently repressed, when you're at the genital stage and now, now your feelings, okay, are in, right, are, are actually adult sexual feelings, if you begin to develop feelings of intimacy and this Oedipal urge with your mother comes up, whoa, the superego says, wow, are you an awful person? And so you just don't have intimate relations. This is Freud's explanation of what men that are called, uh, okay, okay, wait a second. So often what you'll do is you have less guilt with women who are seen as only outlets for the id urge. You just want to have sex with them. Okay, this is kind of like, okay, you just want to have sex with them. The minute intimacy comes, you move on to the next woman. Because when the intimacy comes, there's your mother, there's, there, there's the Oedipal feelings. Okay, there they are. What do we call, does anybody know what that's called? It's sometimes called the Peter Pan syndrome, jumping from woman to woman, never being mature. Does anybody know about the famous character Don Juan in literature? Let's go to the Don Juan. It's often called Don Juanism. Don Juan was the person who, he went from woman to woman to woman, Right? Romancing them all, elegantly, them, causing them all to fall in love with them, and then saying goodbye. I guess today we might call it Will Chamberlainism. I don't know. Will Chamberlain came to have been, how, with how many, 20,000 women? Where am I? He's really clear. My son once did a thing. He took out time for practice, time for playing the games, time to eat, 
I said, <laughs> he had to be, had, the rest of his life had to be one woman after the next. How much time did he have, right? So, right, that's what he claims. So, but that's a Don Juanism kind of a thing. Okay? And of course, there's less guilt for having these sex with, with women to whom you have. Okay? Now, let me ask this question. Come back to me for a second. What happens if even when the slightest sexual contact with a woman causes these id urges to these id urges these these um, phallic urges to come up this urge to be with your mother okay this Oedipal complex to come through by the way does anybody know who Oedipus was who was Oedipus tell us Oedipus' story uh, he was uh, he let's see he killed his father and married his mother as a result of doing it. Yeah. Here, here's what happened to Oedipus. Okay. His father was the king. And the, his, the wise men told him that his son would kill him and take his place. So the, he gets one of his guys and says, take, he has a son. He says, take the son out and kill him. But the guard had pity on him and gave him to a, a, a I think a farm couple, some, another couple to raise. And they raised him as their own. Right? The oracle had told him, right? And he had no idea they were his adoptive parents. So one day he goes off to the oracle, the one, the soothsayer for the Greeks, and he's told, you will kill your father. So he panics, because he thinks it's his adoptive parent, father is his father, was that, and he runs away, and ultimately he becomes an army, and he, he becomes a king someplace else. I don't remember the exact details, but ultimately he's in a battle with this nation, with this other country, who happens to be his father, and he kills his biological father without knowing who he is, and as was the custom of those days, he takes the king's wife for his own. And later he finds out it's his mother. He Push it down? Right. He blinds himself. Yeah, and then, right, he blinds. Afterwards he feels so guilty that he goes out and blinds himself. Exactly. So, <laughs> so these, right, for, for looking upon his mother's Nakedness. So this is the, all the. This is and Freud says this is really Greek society expressing these all these desires. You go blind. Right, becoming a right. You go. Oh, that's right. <laughs> you go blind. That's right. Somebody says, "Oh, you go blind." Right. All right. We won't talk about that anymore. Now, what happens if these Oedipal urges come out even when eat with the slightest contact with a woman? You have a slight, anything intimate, even, even just sex for sex's sake, it's a certain form of intimacy. What happens, would Freud say, if these Oedipal urges come out and your conscious comes, your superman comes and says, bad, 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 bad. What happens? What do you do? What does a man do? Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, he loses his erection. No, no, because even being with a woman, even the thought of it, right, brings up Oedipal urges. What do you do if any sexual concept, you have this, you have this libidinal energy, sexual energy, any contact with a woman makes you feel overwhelmingly guilty, so? Well, okay, go ahead. Did anybody figure it out? Go ahead. You go to the men. That's right. That's Freud's explanation of homosexuality. That it is an incomplete repression of Oedipal, of Oedipal urges, and so you cannot have any contact with women. That's why for a long time, that's why for a long time, right, homosexuality was viewed when, when Freudian thinking dominated the American Psychiatric Society, and so they said, well, it's a mental illness. Interestingly enough, Okay, Freud was one who said that this is so deep in personality that there's, people forget that, he said, there's, there's nothing you can change about this. He said, so if people come to you and they're, right, and they say they have homosexual feelings, work from there, don't try to change it. I mean, there are people who try to change homosexual feelings with, you know, with uh, reinforcement. I don't know if you knew that. They take a person who's homosexual, show the person a picture of a naked man, zing, a little electric shock, right? Then they show a person a picture of a naked, this a male homosexual, of a naked woman, here's some ice cream, your favorite brand of ice cream. It's unbelievable, <laughs> okay? Um, 
if you want to know whether I agree with Freud's explanation of homosexuality, I don't. However, however, as much as we may disagree with Freud, and I count myself as one of the disagrees, Freud is interesting. Most people have had children notice, remember this is called the phallic stage. Kids are very intrigued, this age three to six, with their genitals and with the, and with the genitals of the opposite. It's like sometimes it's called the phallic ele uh, oedipal electra stage, right? This is the age when kids are playing doctor, right? You don't find too many eight-year-olds playing doctor or nine-year-olds playing doctor. Three and four-year-olds do all the time. This is the time when the kid will sit in the middle of the living room, usually boys, but sometimes girls, with his hands down his pants, rubbing his genitals. Right? Watching television, rubbing his genitals. <laughs> and that's what you're supposed to say. That's okay to do, but do it in your own room. <laughs> Not in public. Right? Who are parents with boys? Yeah, have you seen? How old? He's, uh, push it down. He's four. Yeah, and he's done. Tells that plenty, right? Uh, yeah. Push it down, push it down. You don't want to talk, huh? Not in the living room. Because <laughs> you told him not to, right? Because he he's going like this, yeah. Right. They become very intrigued. Often you will see, interestingly, in about fixations, one of the most common things that you see, you'll get a nine-year-old or a ten-year-old. By the way, if you're going to teach kids that age, and if you stay in this business long enough, you'll see it. They, they, it seems like they're already sexually mature. They'll run around picking up girls' skirts, trying to, you know, look, and, you know, uh, 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 trying to get peeks at girls, and, and you say, ooh, look at that, only 10 years old, already sexually interested. No, 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 no. This is not already mature adult sexuality. The kid's still playing doctor back in the genital stage. This is a sign, says Freud, of being emotionally unhealthy, and there are very few people who will tell you this is fine for a nine-year-old to do that, or an eight-year-old, or, right, or even a six-year-old. Most, by the time people get into first grade, they're able to not to do that, right? Okay, so this is Freud's explanation for, for this, and Freud, I gotta tell you something. Freud told us a lot, Erickson, who we'll study next, um, Erickson talked about the fact that um, he, Erickson came after Freud. Erickson lived to the 1990s. So he ran into the whole feminist movement and, all the, and, and, and this whole rejection of roles for men and women being so set the way the Freudians had. And he actually was considered himself a post-Freudian. He said, I can't help it. When I give girls blocks, they build courtyards, round fences. When I give boys blocks, they build towers, right? <laughs> they build their genitals, right? Ever been to Washington, D.C.? You notice how all of our, all of our, the monuments, most of the monuments of the presidents are rotundas, they're round. Jefferson's, Lincoln's. These are the people who nurtured and loved us, brought us into, into being, right? And the Washington Monument? Anybody ever see it? A giant phallic symbol up in the sky. That's the father of the country. When they built the San Jacinto Monument, it was built to be a foot higher than the Washington Monument. Mine's bigger than yours, right? Due to subsidence, I think it's a foot shorter now. <laughs> but, right, oh my God, <sighs> right? I mean, there's all of that kind of stuff, the sexual play that you see, right? All, what, what, all the different sexual preferences that people have. You all have them. No, don't raise your hands and don't, all right? <laughs> but you see, one time, if you want to do something, go, go get, I, 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 had a, uh, I, I did it once. Um, I was going to say I had to do it for a project. It was true because I was looking for, for my professor, but um, for women in pornographic literature and how they were treated. But I actually did this search many years later. Find something that you, for instance, there are some people, you know, feces is being part of, part of the sexual act, right? Back to the anal stage. I've never done it for that one, but get online and do something about that, 
right? Do a search, a Google search. I don't know exactly what to tell you to search. I'm sure you'll find dozens and dozens of websites. Go on for leather, dozens of websites. I mean, whatever you can see, go on for anal sex, oral sex, I don't know, bond, bonding, sadomasochism. Get on there. I'm sure you'll find hundreds of websites for every one of them. Freud has explanations for all of these things. Okay? Now let's get to females. Okay? There's also, Freud calls this the Electra stage for girls. Does anybody know the story of Electra? You know, I've looked online, I can't find it. Electra, um, I don't believe, she was also a figure in Greek mythology. I don't believe that Electra actually had sexual relations with her father. But there was some way in which, again, unbeknownst to her, she had an intimate relation with her father. Ultimately, I, can't, I, I, don't, I looked online, I can't find the story. Probably should go to the library, stop being lazy <laughs> as the librarian. Anybody study Greek mythology remember this? Probably you don't just study this in 10th grade, right? Ultimately, she, she does the same thing. Doesn't blind herself, but she locks herself up away from all society for years, okay? Now, what we're going to have to have here is a way to get girls to identify with their father because for Freud, for Freud, the father is the source of the superego, right? Okay. Well, girls can't have castration complexes, so they have penis envy. They take a look. They're just gone already, right? Boys are afraid. They're, they're full of anxiety. Boys are full of anxiety because of castration. Girls are not. They have penis. They look. It's gone. So they have penis envy. They want one day. I was teaching this, and somebody is at the door, a very good friend of mine, she was on the faculty, right? And she waits for me to do this, she was obviously waiting outside. She jumps in, she says, penis envy? She's screaming this in front of me, penis envy? She says, I have penis pity. <laughs> what is this, right? It's flopping all over, and you're always adjusting yourself, you got to watch, you don't get caught in the zipper. I mean, she gets this tirade about what a, what a pain in the neck it was to have a penis, right? But anyway... Let's go back here. So this is Freud's. Let's just take it for what it's worth. And so how you, where are you going to get a penis? There's only one penis in where you can have. It's your father. So rather than identifying with your father, he admits, the Freudians admit this is not, this is not as well developed. Rather than identifying with your father because you're afraid, you're full of anxiety, he's going to castrate you as the boys, that's the boys' problem, the girls identify with Freud, with with. Another Freudian step. The girls identified with their father because they have envy for a penis, only their father has one. Okay? And so they identify with their fathers, right? This is a way to get away from the mother, okay? Because both of them are identifying with the mother because she's the source of, 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 of nurturance and nutrition, right? Okay? But Freud says this lack of castration anxiety leads to a weaker superego. Okay? Let me explain that for one second. Come back to me. In other words... Boys overwhelmingly identify with their father because they're terrified of their father. I'm going to be just like you because I'm afraid of you. Okay? Girls do it out of a selfish motive, a different selfish motive. Boys have the same selfish motive, which is I, I you know, I want I want I need one like you, right? I want to, you're my, you're my, my, uh, you're the only place I can have one I need to get my envy. You're the only place I can have a penis. You're my, uh, um, I can't think of the word. Just getting old. Is, what? Vicarious. You're my, you know, it's my, my vicarious. You become like my eye because I, I get my penis vicariously through you. Okay? So, in one way, but when Freud says there's a lack of a superego, interestingly enough, if you look in most societies, okay, most people in general, there's a feeling that women are more moral than men and men need to be controlled. Okay? I'll tell you from my own tradition. In Jewish tradition, for instance, um, there are certain things you're obligated to do because of the right thing to do, and there are certain things you're obligated to do to remind you to do the right thing. Like you're supposed to pray three times a day to remind you. You're supposed to wear fringes on the corners of your garments. If you look at numbers, if you've ever seen traditional Jews pray, they pray right to remind you. It says right in... Uh, I have it in my back pocket, but I, we won't go. I think it's in numbers. So you, that you should remember my commandments. Women are not required to do any of the reminder things. Only men. And it says straight up, because they're more moral than we are. 
on a fast day, like on Yom Kippur, everyone has to fast, right? You don't eat or drink for 25 hours. Well, you can't do that to kids, right? So the literature, the, the, the women, the rabbinic literature says, let the women feed the kids. They won't be so tempted to, to eat as men will be. Okay, and there's this feeling, and in many ways, Freudian psychology explains this pretty well because men have this aggressive person that they want, they want to achieve. Women are more nurturing, it's easy. They don't, they don't have, they don't have as many of these urges, says Freud, to do antisocial things as men do. When he says women has, have a weaker superego, he's probably talking about, he seems to be talking about the ego ideal. Okay, and it's, he's clearly reflecting the society of his day. There were only one thing that women did. They became mothers, right, and raised children. And if they didn't do that, they went into one of the two nurturing professions, nurses or teachers, right? And, and the boys had to decide as they were becoming men, what do I do? What am I supposed to do? Where am I supposed to be? What's, what am I supposed to my role in life? What kind of person am I going to be? What job am I going to have? What am I going to do for a living? What's more important to me, right? Is it money? Is it fame? Is it recognition? Right? Those things aren't always the same. People who run junkyards, right, who own junkyards make a lot more money than people who are faculty members. Take my word for it. But there's more prestige in being a faculty member, right? They make more than more money than judges. There's more prestige in being a judge. It's amazing. Lawyers are very, very low on the prestige thing. Most people don't have a lot of, right? You become a judge, all of a sudden, whoosh, the lawyer becomes a judge, jumps up near the top. So, well, you know, when you ask people. But in any case, you, you see the point. So this is what he's really talking about. It's what he seems to be talking about. Um, the weak ego idea. And, and that's, while that modern society has kind of clearly has made that m much less true, um, it's, it's, it's still interesting that Freud talks about this. I have to tell you, by the way, I have a friend who's not a Freudian. We're driving down Cullen, right, the entrance to the university. And we drive through, and he kicks a quick look, and he looks back. He says to me, this university has an inferiority complex vis-a-vis -vis some other university in this state. He didn't know, right? We studied together <laughs> at, at, at Harvard. I said, how do you know? He says to me, two of them? Like these two giant phallic symbols. You know what I'm talking about on Cullen? Five phallic symbols sticking up into the sky. He says, come on. I said, you're right. I said, it's UT and maybe A&M. He said, oh, that's why there are two. You know, I mean, he just, he was giggling, but he's not a Freudian, but it just struck him. What, what kind of a way is that for an interest in a university? These two giant phallic symbols up into the sky. So there is a lot that happens with kids. The, the precociousness, the sexuality of little kids that goes away, et cetera, et cetera. That Freud really explains pretty well. And you have to remember that Freud is the one who talked about unconscious motivation, right? You don't know why you feel the way you do, you just do. You don't know why you prefer this kind of movie or that kind of movie to be mundane, or this kind of sexual act or that kind of sexual act, or this kind of way of organizing yourself or that kind of way of organizing yourself. Why you want to get organized and can't, or why you're so organized that sometimes you drive yourself crazy and can't seem to stop, or why this or why that. And Freud said it all comes from these unconscious motives. Later he says, let's go to the next stage. The latency stage, said, Freud says, what happens at the latency stage? You'll notice 6 to 12, that's school. That's why I have it in red to show you. You're not supposed to have red on here, but I couldn't help it, right? Uh, they tell me it's not a good color for TV, but I don't care, okay? The libido, the sexual aggressive fantasies, the, the source of sexual aggressive fantasies is latent, although it's probably not gone, but you get much less this precociousness, this lifting up girls, this playing doctors and all that tends to go away. And this is the time where the kid begins to demonstrate more self-control, the super ego's in place, and this is the time devoted more to intellect than to emotion, a time for learning both cognitive and social skills. Okay, come, okay, come back to me for a second. This is, interesting enough, Freud considered the intellect what he called the conflict-free sphere of the ego. Okay? In other words, you can be neurotic as hell and still be able to solve a problem. That's the old, pro that's the old saying, 
What's the difference between a neurotic and a psychotic? A neurotic, a psychotic thinks two plus two is five. A neurotic thinks two plus two is four, but it makes her nervous, right? Today's a she day. I got a better one, I got a better one. What's the difference between a neurotic and a psychotic? A neurotic draws castles in the sky, a psychotic lives in them, and the therapist collects the rent, right? That one's a little better. Okay, in other words, unless, you, unless you com you're completely gone and you become completely psychotic, okay, and Freud has explanations for psychoses, right? Um, even if you're full of neurotic tendency, full of upsets, full of unresolved issues, you can usually function okay in the intellectual sphere, but not always. Right? So if you have a tremendous fear of competing with your with a parent, and the parent you're with a parent, and the parent was good at something, and you have a feeling that you can be better, you'll fail on purpose. Or you will excel in an area that's very different from your parents, so you don't have to compete. Or you'd excel in an area that's very similar to your parents, so you're identifying. Well, so, so for instance, my, my, my parents were both the same kind of person I'm, you know, history and literature and psychology and reading and all that stuff. And I'm that way too. My brother, and he admits, he said, I just didn't want to put up with that stuff. So my brother went into science, has his master's degree in chemistry. Now he became a computer jock a computer architect, and he got sick of this, so he said, I'm going to go into business for myself. Of course, it's some electronic thing, setting up high-end speakers for churches and auditoriums and stuff like that. All completely different from my parents. That's the problem with Freud. Oh, you over-identified, and your father was, your brother was rebelling against, you know. Whatever happens, he has an explanation for it. So, the Freudians will tell you that, that while we don't deal with intellect, and it's a, it's a conflict-free sphere of the ego, emotional upsets can interfere with, with the ability to, with what you learn, how you learn, even the ability to learn. There's a wonderful book, come back here, called Summerhill. You got to read the first one by A.S. Neal. I believe he spells his name this way. Read the first one. Because the new, the new Summerhill is not so Freudian. It's a school based completely upon Freudian principles. Right? He describes it in England for upper middle class young boys. Adolescent boy. Okay, come back to me. I read the whole book and it's all Freudian. One time there's a kid who said, I want to smash all the windows in the dining hall. So Neal said to him, go ahead, smash them. I don't care. It's A.S. Neal. He said, I don't care. It's a great read. It's not for psychology. It's just fun. Excuse me. It's a fun book. So he smashed all the windows. I'll just build your father. So he smashed all the windows and began to talk about it. And he talked about boys with all kinds of conflicts and upsets and this and that. I read the end of the book and I said, it was a very fascinating book. I said, something's bugging me. And then I realized. And he talked about one kid who was very poor in his studies and how it improved as his therapy got better. I said, but something's bugging me. And then I realized he never mentioned one word about what actually went on in the classrooms. Not a word. The whole idea was, once you're mentally healthy, you will achieve. And that's really, and, and we've seen that starting our discussions with Ben Dora, when he said you've got to be mentally healthy to achieve. If you have a low self-efficacy, you're not going to achieve. Even if you know more than the person who is mentally healthy, that person will achieve more than you do, has a higher self-efficacy. Okay? This is a time where kids are developing skills, they're gaining abilities, etc., etc. They're getting a sense of themselves. Their ego is dominant. What society demands. Okay, the superego doesn't have to work so hard. Superego doesn't have to work that hard, right? Because it's. Because libido is suppressed. Remember, okay? The, the ego is dominant. The ego now, by the way, the ego's job is not only between you and society, but between the person and society, but now between the id and the superego. We talked about that already. Well, the superego is, doesn't have to work so hard. The id is a, little, is a little suppressed now. So the ego now can concentrate on what's reality. You want what you want? If you want stuff, 
Now, if you want the watch, instead of smashing over her head, learn, get studies, go to college. Then you earn enough money to get her watch. To get a watch. You don't have to steal hers. Here's the way to get what you want. By learning the skills. Well, you want to be rewarded? You want to get cookies? Learn the multiplication tables. You get cookies for it. Okay, that kind of thing. This is where you, the ego begins to say, ah, oh, this is what society demands from me to get what I need to get to, to make my way, etc., etc. This is a time, and this is school. And bad, bad things happen, say the Freudians. Everybody says that. If you don't get those skills, you become frustrated, become overwhelmed. You feel that there's no way that you can function. You begin to steal what you need. You begin to become antisocial because you don't have the skills that society demands for you to get what you want. Okay? And finally, we're going to talk about the genital stage. That's adult sexuality. And the genital stage, and you'll notice, the genital stage is, comes in at puberty and lasts for the rest of our lives. Okay? It's red because it's hot. Okay? Here, here, the libido, the libido comes back. Horne, is it? I can't remember who it is. I think it's Karen Horne, who says, don't quote me on that. The libido attacks the ego and the superego, I might add. There's stress, anxiety, turmoil, turmoil, loss of confidence. All of a sudden, your libido comes rushing back. What Freud calls Sturm und Drang. Storm and stress, anxiety, right? There's another word. It'll come to me in a second. Okay? That's puberty. And the social component of it is adolescence. Okay, enter adolescence. Now there's a tremendous attack on the ego and the superego. Okay? This attack on the ego, you lose your way. Who am I? What am I? What am I going to do with life? An attack on the superego, which is this need, right? The super... This, the, the, the super ego is having a hard time keeping these id urges under control. And Freud is going to tell you, people who go out and commit sexual crimes, they cannot, it's the super ego losing the battle. Okay? And people, and the id overcomes, can overcomes people. Now, I've got to tell you right now, Freud has a very different view of, of, Pornography, violence, etc., etc., than does than does Bandura. Freud talks about a word that he calls. It's probably in the slide here. He calls catharsis. So Freud will tell you the following. Okay. A catharsis is a release of sexual energy. Okay. So, for instance, at this stage, he's going to say an orgasm is a cathartic experience, at least sexual energy. So he'll tell you what. People who have this urge to commit violence, let's say, to, to rape people, right? You go into there, a man who has an urge to rape a woman. Well, you go into that person's apartment, and you'll see videotapes of, of rape. And you'll see magazines of rape. And you'll see magazines of violence against women. And Bendura says, you see, you see, I told you. This person is modeling everything that he's read. For I said, what are you talking about? Said, Who buys these magazines anyway? You think some Joe Schmo off the street buys these magazines? Oh, that's a good idea. This is a person who has these overwhelming urges already. And he's trying to get a cathartic experience. His supergirl's telling him, you can't do that. You're not allowed to go and do that. By releasing it another way. By watching it on television. By reading about it in magazines and releasing the sexual under that way, right, with, through masturbation or something like, you know, like that, right? Freud's saying it's just the opposite. Sure, that stuff is all, all there. And Freud says, you know, 99% of the people who watch violence don't do it. Okay? And indeed, most people, right? If you were, most, the vast majority of people in, in, uh, in the world, if you were to give them magazines on, on sex with a child, would be repulsed by this. They say, get it away from me. No, it's the people who, who's, who have these 
sexual desires that are now coming out generally for whatever reason. Okay, we can't go into it now, and I'm not sure I could do it without doing more research, go back through old notes, etc. They read all this stuff because they know it's wrong, and they're trying hard to get it through cathartically. So it's a big disagreement with Bandura. Freud would say, that's what you should do with someone who has antisocial sexual urges or antisocial violent urges. Violence can also come out, so it's a hate of someone, right? Hate of, the, hate of one of the parents. Come out, let them watch it, let them read about it. Maybe that'll stop them from actually doing it. Okay, in any case, let's go back to this here. Okay, adult sexual feelings cause much sexual and social conflict, particularly at puberty and, and at adolescence. Remember, puberty is the physiological term, right? And adolescence is the social term. And, and there comes a looking for places, one's place and role in life. Feeling one's, and freeing oneself from one's parents is the primary task of the adolescent. I'm going to be my own person. I'm going to look and see who I am and what I am. Okay? If you, if you teach high school, you will see the following coming out. Person A comes in, and he's got a suit on, a suit, and he's carrying a briefcase, and he's going to be, his goal is to be, to get his MBA and be the president of some company. That's in September. Comes back after Christmas vacation, has a punk rock shirt on, hair is combed up straight, dyed blue, and has, his body is pierced in 14 different places, right? Same person will go back, you come back after the winter break or after the spring break. The same person is carrying a Bible and is going around and is going to be a missionary and bring peace and love to the world, right? And, and if it doesn't happen in a year, it'll happen over the course of two or three years. Who am I? What am I? What am I supposed to do? Do I identify with my father or not identify with my father? In what way? Right? You think, oh, it's great. Father has a big business, I'll go into my father's business. That's tough for adolescents. Right, I have to be my own person. Okay? And Freud says, let's go back to the PowerPoint, that this stress, this overwhelming sexual tension, wait a second, let me, uh, come back to me for a second. This is complicated by the fact that adolescents become a long stretch. My mother tells a story that her mother told her. My grandfather got in trouble for his, my, he was studying to be a rabbi, and he got in trouble for his political opinions. Right? where he was studying, what's called a yeshiva, a place where you study to be a rabbi. So he got thrown out. And he went to another one and had to start again. And my grandmother decided to wait for him. And her mother, my great-grandmother, she told my mother that her mother cried every day that her daughter was an old maid, waiting for him and waiting for him and waiting until he finally finished. My grandmother got married at the age of 19, right? 16 was you're supposed to get married at the latest. We have extended adolescence, right? There are people sitting in this class who never occurred to you to get married and have a family or taking the class and there until, right, you finished college. It never occurred to you. No one even told you how to think about being an adult until you were in your junior year in college, right? Anybody in that situation you're, where you, it just never occurred to you we were going to do anything except go to college? Right? And you're 19 or 20, well, there are plenty of people taking this like that. We've extended adolescence a long way. What? Married? 18 and already married? Oh my God. Many societies handle it. We say, you reach puberty? That's it. Get married. Okay? But we don't do that. So, and we, and we, and actually, the truth is, it's very difficult. We tell people, don't do that. Don't get married when you're 16. Are you nuts? Gotta finish high school. Go to college or go to trade school. Do something. Okay? So we have an extended adolescence, and so what we do here, we have defense mechanisms. Freud talks about defense mechanisms. Didn't talk about, these are the things we use, like anal compulsion, all that. Those are defense mechanisms. Mechanisms that we use in our personality to deal with feelings, okay? Taking flight, literally, or by isolating oneself. This is all the adolescent runaways that we have. Or, my daughter locked herself in a room for a year, right? Hanging, painting it black and white and hanging kiss posters all over, right? Which at that time was far out, you know. And that was it. Now nah, she's just the most wonderful person in the world. She's a nurse. She's just a lovely person. But that was adolescence. She was 14, 15, I think. Okay? Isolating yourself. Leave me alone. Contempt for parents. Mark Twain once said, 
It amazes me. When I was 15, my father knew nothing. Now I'm 25. It's amazing how much he learned in 10 years. I can't believe it, right? Contempt for parents. Get that all the time. Sound familiar? Asceticism. Strict diets. This is Freud's explanation for um, um, bulimia and anorexia. Rigorous exercise regimens. Refuse to participate in fun activities. Freud noticed this a lot in adolescence. This is a lot in adolescence. By the way, Freud just peaked here, and it's amazing how much he knew just by talking to his clients, mostly women. He didn't really do a lot of research, but he had, he had insight. He was a brilliant man. Right? You don't need to agree to people who believe they're brilliant. You notice I don't agree with Skinner, but he was a brilliant, brilliant, okay? And intellectualization, constructive, elaborate philosophies, identification with idealistic movements. Today we can go beyond that. The person who comes in, I'm going to be the CEO, is an identification with a lifestyle. You'll notice that when you, that when you these protest marches, we just had some recently, most of the people marching protest marches are young. They have an ideal, therefore, right? Winston Churchill once said, I don't get into politics, but it illustrates it. He said, a man who is not a socialist in his 20s has no heart. He said, a man who is still a socialist in his 40s has no head. Right? What was he saying? And he was in his 40s when he said, he said, my ideals that I had, they've calmed down now. Right? You know. Interestingly enough, he was a very idealistic person. He was the one person who said, there's no dealing with the Nazis. He had one thing, he understood, he understood fanatic totalitarian regimes. Later he said, there's no dealing with the communists. They have no morality, they're evil, they're going to do things. Right. And he, he wouldn't, he, you know, Hitler made overtures to him. You're, you're Anglo-Saxons, you're Germanic people. I'll control Europe, you control the rest of the world through the British Empire. And that appealed to some of the British. We don't have to fight Hitler. Churchill said no. The same thing. He's the one who coined the term Iron Curtain for communism, which killed millions of people, more than the Nazis. Soviet Union killed more people than the Nazis. Had longer to do it, but it was all right. So it was quite a, and by the way, so did communist China, but that's politics we didn't. So, but, but he was saying, look, even there, even though I'm quite, uh, you know, he was quite an idealistic person, we, we tend to calm down, into, we tend to calm down, but we, we need the, the strong sense of identification of who we are and what we are, okay? And ultimately, what we find, wait one second, come back to me. What we find from Freud is this need for, is, is, is several important things here that have to deal with adult person. The kids, are tr adolescents, are trying to find themselves, who they are, and what they are. And I've got to give you a mandatory lecture here. Adolescents get depressed, okay? Adolescents also want to torture their children, okay? Many, many adolescents, will, will they want to torture their parents, excuse me. <laughs> Whew, but I, this is more Freudian slips, right? So they will torture their parents by saying, I want to kill myself. Right? I used to torture my parents by saying, I'm not going to college. Oh, my God, I thought they were going to... I lived in a suburb where most of us were the children of... the grandchildren of immigrants, and our parents had not gone to college. But you're going to college. I didn't go to college, but you are. Right? About, probably about 60, 70% of us were in that boat. Okay? So, and, and you know, it used to amaze the kids... I had a friend, her father was the uh, dentist in town, right? And he, you know, he was family had been in America for God knows how long, right, forever. And she was going to college. And she couldn't get over how intense our parents were about it, like it was a mission in life, you know. Just, her father was cool about it, you know. It was just, it was a different thing. So that's, that's how I tortured them. Some t adolescents will torture their parents by saying, I'm going to kill myself or I want to die. And they don't really mean it. But some of them do mean it. And if you get that, if you get that, you've got to tell somebody. You've got to tell the counselor or the principal, you've got to do it. The clinic I worked in for years and years, I worked in because the person who was the head of the clinic knew that he was a very good therapist, but he didn't know anything about education. 
Now, we worked together well for years because I said, I'm no fair. I know a lot about education. He didn't try to, you know, I know a lot about education. He didn't try to teach people things by therapizing them. They had to know, they needed an educator, someone who knew about cognition and development. But I didn't try to be their, their therapist. Don't do it either. You need to, you can, if you, somebody tells you that, and, and you'll be surprised if you're going to be middle school teacher or high school teacher, how that can happen. Even when you get older, people come in for student teaching. Right? This depression can last until, you know, I don't want to cast dispersion on anybody here. 1920 is still adolescence in many cases. People go through college, they're on, anybody here on your second major, third major, fourth major, ringing a bell? My son went through, I think, six majors before he found out what he wanted to do, one of my sons. He, he's great at it, you know, emergency management. He loves it to pieces, but it took a while. Right, and you might find people are coming, but you have to report it. You particularly have to, you have to report it, you have to tell somebody. You're not a therapist, okay? Even if you have a good relation with this person, you gotta tell. I even had one time where a girl threatened to do it in, a, in the school where I was, and the principal told me, because I had a degree in psychology, I said, I'm not that kind of a guy. It was a small private school, I taught one class. And he, he said, ah, she's just, I said, if you don't tell, her parents, or the school counselor, I'm going to tell. So he did, okay? You have to, you have to understand how kids' ha mental health is very important. Let's go to Freud and education, and we'll talk about that a little more. Okay, PSA said that education should be about thinking, not about learning facts. People can think will learn. Freud implies that education should be about concern for students' emotional health and welfare, not about learning facts. People's emotional needs are met will learn. We talked about that. Okay, whoops, sorry. Okay, come back to me. So in the end, I screwed up this thing, I'm gonna have to look. In the end, Freud is going to tell you, Freud is going to tell you that, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm looking here, I've got a, I lost an arrow, I don't know. Okay, Freud is going to tell you, okay, we're all set, that the purpose of education the purpose of education is to make kids mentally healthy, to worry about their mental health, okay? And that education is much, much more about facts. It's about, it's about understanding people's, how people are, about trying to get healthy kids. There's something else here. You have to understand, as we went through this stuff, you have your, you're nuts too, let me put it that way right? Your insistence that everybody be exactly organized and taking off points if the kid's notebook is not meet, neat and the kid's getting A's on tests, that's your mental problem, not the kid's. I will never forget, after I had a class, it was a history class, I love history, I was getting a, a great grade and the teacher said, where are all the papers that I gave back? And I had stuffed them into a, into a notebook, I just stuffed them all in there. I don't think she even told us we had to keep them organized, I couldn't have anyway. She said, and she deducted credit for that. That's her problem, not mine. I knew the history. Why do I have to be the way you are? It's very, very difficult to do that. You should remember that one of the most sloppy, disorganized people in the history of the universe was Albert Einstein. Okay? So most of the questions we ask about the purpose of learning and how important is behavior and how important is thinking, those don't apply with Freud. But what does apply, what does apply is the sense, is the sense that, that we have to be very, very careful about human interactions, about, about worrying about how kids are mentally healthy and about watching ourselves. It's hard, it's hard. I mean, I have to tell you, one of the reasons I got out of teaching is because I couldn't stand all the, t all the little micro, mini administrative things that drove me crazy, because I don't really have that kind of a personality. But there's room in the world for personalities like that. And as a teacher, you ought to know that. 
there's no place else in the world. There's no place in the world where it works like this. You got 45 minutes to do this. Do it, do it, do it, do it. Brr, bell rings, run to the next place. If you're 10 seconds late, all hell breaks loose. You get penalized. Do this, I do this, Tevin, it's gotta come in tomorrow. Then do this, next thing's gotta come in tomorrow. Then do the next thing gotta come in tomorrow. You see the emotion that I have? Look at the emotion that I have in this, behind this. You can tell how school just wasn't for my personality. Can you imagine telling an architect, you have 45 minutes to do this and done? And you can't talk to anybody else either. Here's how we're going to work. You do this and come in the next thing, give me this part. The next thing, come in this part. You don't have time to think it over. You don't have time to do it. There's not a far off deadline by which you can do it. You can't say, listen, I've got a brilliant idea. Just give me, can, can we get another 48 hours to do it? Okay. So you can see people with my kind of a personality. Did you see the emotion pouring out of me? School really, it got me upset emotionally. There are people taking this course who want to be teachers because they loved it and want to reproduce it. And there are people here who, could, who didn't like it and want to make it better. Okay? Who are very angry with what happened in school. Let me again emphasize to tell you I know the best way to run a school. And it's the same answer about the best way to teach mathematics, way to teach reading. It depends on the kid. And you need to have a place in your classroom for each kid. And you need to remember people have different personalities. And you need to remember when something gets you super upset, that may be your problem, not the kid's problem. And you need to worry if you're teaching adolescents, I know most people taking this course don't, but some of you are, about their emotional health and what's going on with them and they're trying to, to, to find their way in life. Okay? Now, one of the reasons we did Freud, I know, I know, I know. It's, uh, one of the reasons I want to do Freud is because he's really the background for most of the mental health theories that have come along before. I don't, okay, come along before. Um, that have come along since, since then. And I want to talk about another one. I, I, I'll, another one. Um, is Erickson next on the syllabus or humanism? It's Erickson, right? Good. Okay. I'm not going to be here because of, for the discussion, those who are taking the tape of uh, humanism because it's a Jewish holy day and I'm taking off all this multiculturalism stuff. You're surprised what you get, okay? I do want to talk, uh, start about, on Erickson, okay? Erickson studied with Anna Freud, okay? And here, there he is. He studied with Anna Freud, who was Freud's daughter, was a classic Freudian, and he claimed, at least initially, to expand it on Freud, Freud's theory. Okay, as I said, there he is. He, he... Freud's theory was a psychosexual theory. Erickson's theory is a psychosocial theory. Okay, so he's saying, I'm going to talk about the social aspects of Freud's theory. Okay, and Erickson talked about the epigenetic principle. This is, says there is a natural predetermined order to development. Personality growth follows a sequence of inner preordained laws, i.e. it's maturational, it's biologically determined. And each person develops through a sequence of stages that emerge in accordance with a preset plan. We don't construct the stages, they just come. Now, this is true of Freud's stages too. But Erickson is the first one to state this as a principle. Okay? The stages are just coming. And at each stage, the person is confronted with a crisis, a social crisis, a psychosocial crisis that has to be resolved. It's not just a personal crisis. It's a psychosocial crisis. For, so for each of Freud's stages, he's going to show you a psychosocial crisis. Each crisis is represented by a healthy and an unhealthy resolution that can be represented as polar opposites on a straight line, on a straight line. Like the first one is trust versus mistrust. Okay? This is the healthy one, you become a trusting person. And this is the unhealthy one, you become a mistrusting person. The healthiest resolution is not right there at the very end, but right there. You have to have a little bit of mistrust, because some people are not to be trusted. We have words for people who trust everybody. We'll get to that. Suckers. Right. Say it again. Gullible. Gullible, exactly. So and a person's a social environment has an enormous influence 
on how each stage is resolved, but it doesn't determine the sequence of stages. Okay, come back to me. So Erickson is going to tell us, I have Freud's, but he's telling, I have stages just like Freud's stages. I have the social, psych, psychosocial aspect of Freud's stages, but he's telling us something very different also. He's saying, we're not basically as gimme, 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 I want it. It's mine. I'm going to smash you over the head if I don't get it. Every woman I see, I really want to rape, but my super ego is saying, no, 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 no. Okay, I really want to sleep with my mother, and I want to kill my father. He's saying there's a healthy resolution, too. There's a healthy resolution. Okay, you want to hear, okay, you want, uh, next time I will start, just to give you an idea about health and unhealth, how Freud explains anti-Semitism. It comes from the fact that every Christian really wants to kill Jesus, right? And how Freud, on how Freud, don't worry, got everybody off, explains the commitment of Jews to their religion despite tremendous pressure for them to convert through the centuries, just because they murdered Moses, okay? So you'll, you'll see how Freud thinks behind every decent urge is a sickness, and how Erickson says, uh-uh, I don't think so. There is a healthy way to be in the world. And this is the movement away from Freud's idea of people basically sick and ugly to saying there is a healthy way. And we'll see that in Erickson. We'll see that in, we'll see that in Maslow and in the humanists. And ultimately, we will see that also in the social aspects of organismic developmental psychology through Kohlberg. Okay, see you next time.